should we start maybe i'll just, I'll just talk about uh, the study group for a few minutes and then start off uh so go study group is a is a meet up that uh, we do once every two weeks uh i i don't know how many of you uh, have joined uh, today for the first time uh, however this is just information for you that uh, uh, we have this um, repo over here in this account called golang india uh, and you can find all the session details of past sessions uh, as well as uh, any future sessions we might hold uh, over here uh, what you need to do is you need to go to issues uh, and if you would like to propose a talk uh, or if you would like uh, to hear a talk on on a certain uh, topic uh, please uh, open a new issue uh, over here and uh, when you open a new issue you get a uh, you get a choice of whether you would like to propose a talk or whether you would want somebody else to propose a talk uh you will also see uh, issues for past uh, topics which have which we have um had in some of the previous sessions over here uh and all the videos for all the sessions are also available on youtube you will find links for that um uh over here from the main page uh, you can go to past sessions um and you you will find a, a video link for each of the sessions uh so so the study group is is completely volunteer driven um as of now we are about four five volunteers uh gaurav from chennai uh dinesh uh ankur anand um, and me uh, we are we are from bangalore uh also just a show of um, um, i know there's something which i would have um probably done if uh, there was a this is a regular talk um uh could could all of you please uh, post on the chat uh if you are um, new to golang uh, and whether you have written any tests uh, in golang before basically this is just help me uh, paste the talk uh, accordingly uh, so what i'm interested in knowing is whether uh, you have written any uh whether whether you are familiar with the unit tests in go um and whether you are you are familiar with unit tests in some other language uh two questions basically whether you have done it in go and whether you have done it in some other language uh if, if you could share that info on the chat that will help me a lot thanks so the contents of today's talk are going to be from a from a talk which i gave at the golang bangalore meetup uh, in september uh, this year uh, this talk was um, was a beginner level talk but it it went into uh, some more details of uh, fixtures and things like that uh, but what i'm planning now is basically uh, at least for today's session i would start off with the uh, with some contents from this presentation but maybe we can have a series of talks uh, on testing in go um the first one being uh, a very basic one uh, as of today uh, but uh, over over the course of multiple sessions maybe we can cover uh, uh, test driven development and uh, you know code coverage and all the all the aspects of uh, um uh, testing in go basically all all the tools and how to use them and so on um so i mean we are not going to have uh, the same uh, testing in go sessions every consecutive one but maybe once in a few uh, sessions we we could we could plan on having a a session on on testing in go and this could be in parts and uh, if uh, any of you are interested you can also take turns uh, in in presenting this uh, i mean i i don't want this to be just me um so feel free if you would like to uh, pitch in uh, also i am not uh, i mean i i would i would probably not be interested in going uh, along the same contents which i already presented here uh, because this session could be more uh, interactive we can uh, diversify a little bit um, i'm also going to go a little slower 
so that there's more uh, scope for Q&A. Uh, please feel free to stop me and ask uh, any question anytime. It need not be related to just go uh, alone. I mean, anything related to testing uh, in general is also fine. Um, there is also a place where you can uh, ask uh, ask questions. So basically, every uh, proposal which we do in the study group uh, has has an issue. And uh, please feel free to uh, write a comment under each of these uh, issues in case you have any questions that you would like to ask. Uh, preferably, we would prefer uh, if you would ask in public and basically ask it under this issue so that uh, any Q&A that happens is available to everyone. Um, and you know, people visiting this uh, link in the future will also benefit from the uh, discussion. So, uh, any any questions uh, so far uh, before we just start off? Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your uh, feedback. All right, so, uh, so we'll start off with the um, basic principles. Um, so you guys are able to see my screen, right? I'm currently presenting now. I'll take that as a yes. Um, all right, so um, sure most of you are familiar with the term uh, unit test. Uh, so a unit test is basically a test uh, which tries to um, verify maybe one condition or one one piece of functionality uh, in some code that you have written. Uh, the objective of a unit test is that uh, you, you basically have one condition that you're checking for and there's only one reason for one unit test to fail, uh, which is if, if that condition is not met. Uh, so, so by definition, unit tests would then be uh, the smallest uh, element that you can sort of independently test. Uh, so unit tests are meant to be fast um, and ideally they live along with the code. Uh, they're not uh, differentiated heavily in terms of uh, uh, how they're maintained and things like that. Most, most of the times uh, the tests are written by the developer who writes the functionality for, um, for the actual uh, code in use. Um, so Go has a, a very good uh, test runner um, and a library to help with the testing. Um, so most of the unit test frameworks uh, in, in most languages, though they're written as unit test frameworks, they, they come with the enough uh, batteries to use it uh, as a general purpose uh, test uh, tool, uh, test runner as such. Uh, so the Go test tool is also uh, something that fits into that nature. Uh, and we'll see how we can utilize the Go test tool for all of these things. Um, so in today's talk, we're going to discuss briefly about uh, how to write tests and what the features that the Go test tool provides. Um, and uh, we'll see how to uh, scale up tests. So basically, once you've started writing some of the basic tests, how do you sort of expand it to handle more pieces of data and uh, uh, how, how how do you test the suite of um, tests uh, against multiple implementations and so on? Um, so let's uh, start with that. Uh, so there, there are a few slides over here which uh, describe what are unit tests and what are the other automated tests and so on. So I'll skip all of those parts because uh, you can probably go to this uh, presentation and read it later on. Uh, so. A simple way to invoke uh, go test is by using the command line. Um, and the way you do it is uh, by invoking go test. And what go test does is it looks, uh, depending on which folder you are in, uh, it starts looking for files which have a file name of nature, uh, say something underscore test dot go. So all files which end with underscore test.go are uh, candidates for the go test tool uh, to pick them up and run tests inside those. 
for the code that's inside it. Uh, within a test file, uh, the Go test runner will look for uh, functions of this nature. Any function which starts with the word test, uh, followed by anything you want. Uh, and it should have the signature, uh, which is a pointer to an object called testing.t. So testing is a, is a package available in Go. Um, and uh, this package contains some of the primitives which are used for testing. Uh, T stands for test. There are a few others. Uh, there's one called uh, B, which is for benchmarks. Um, but we will get into those things more in detail. But uh, let, let's work with the testing.t for now. So, so the, the element that gets inserted into this test or gets injected into this test is a, is a pointer to testing.t. And um, what this t object does is basically it holds the context for that given test. So, um, and it is it is it is expected to be private for that particular test. And uh, all the things that you do with respect to the test, like for example, uh, verifying and deciding whether a test has passed or failed, uh, or if you would like to skip a test and so on. So basically, all the uh, parameters that you would like to tweak with respect to a test are are done on that uh, testing.t object that is injected by the test runner itself. Uh, we'll come back to this slide a little later. Uh, let's let's look at a very basic example of a test. Uh, by the way, all the uh, examples that I'm showing here in the in the slides over here are also available in the repo. So there's a folder called samples, and uh, within this there is example one, example two, example three, uh, and all the code that I'm showing you over here comes comes out of these files. Uh, so a sample test.go, uh, uh, which is a very, very basic example over here. Uh, so the first line has import testing uh, because we need to uh, use the testing.t object over here. Um, and we have written one single test function. Uh, it's called test example. And t is the uh, name of the variable, which is a pointer to testing.t. And uh, a simple thing we want to do now is to just log a message that says hello world. Uh, and for us, uh, so let's actually run this uh, test. Right, so this is the file. So, if, so while you're in this folder, if you simply say go test, uh, you would be invoking the test runner, uh, and Go test is going to fetch all the files which are ending with underscore t uh, underscore test dot go in in this folder, um, and then it look for all the functions and then execute them as tests. Uh, the default output from a Go test execution is is fairly minimal. Uh, if the test pass, you'll you'll probably see very little output of this nature. Um, but if if you see a test fail, you will see the name of the test that is failing and so on. If you'd like more verbose output, um, you can pass uh, a minus V flag. Uh, minus V flag is also required if you are doing the, the T dot log uh, calls. So the content of the log is printed only when you uh, run it and run it with the verbose flag enabled. So so we have run, now run it with minus V so that we can see the hello world. Uh, now, like I mentioned that there is uh, something called T for testing and B for benchmark. Uh, both, uh, both these objects have, I mean, they, they come out of the same, uh, same package and they also share a common interface, but the, uh, the way they are used and what they're used for uh, varies a fair bit. Uh, the testing T object is used to Verify pieces of functionality, verify the API, and so on. Uh, the benchmark uh, object is used to run a particular piece of code uh, multiple times. I mean, the, the test runner does it for you. Uh, it it you can you can supply contents within the test function within the within the benchmark test, 
uh, and then the go test tool will run it multiple times and then tell you how fast it is and it will tell you uh, how uh, what kind of resources it is consuming and so on but both uh, the testing.t object and the testing.b um, object they share the same interface which is this um, and these are the methods that are available in it but you can sort of broadly classify them into these four categories so you you could either skip a test uh, you could also log messages you can uh, log errors in a test uh, and when you log an error in a test um, the test is marked failed but then the execution of the test continues uh, there is also a call called fatal uh, and you, when you call fatal it not only uh, marks the test as a fail but it also stops execution at that point uh, and then uh, um, so that that test stops there and uh, the test runner continues with the rest of the tests so in most of the cases you will probably be calling t dot fatal so a very common pattern uh, further is to uh, parameterize tests i'm sure um, people uh, deal with this sort of thing very often uh, i saw someone mention um, python before so in case you've used um, test runners like um, even the, the default unit test runner in python or something like pytest you might be familiar with the uh, pytest parameterize so basically these are data driven tests so you have a test logic, um, but you have multiple sets of inputs with which you would like to test this test logic. Each uh, set of input is uh, is a candidate uh, which could be represented as an independent test. Uh, and you have wh what you basically do is you have a table with all your test inputs and your expected responses, um, and then you iterate over it um, and run the test. So we will take a very basic example here of um, adding integers this seems like the hello world of uh, all examples though so this is a function which uh, which takes an arbitrary number of integers uh, it's a very uh, function with arguments and you just run over all of the integers that are passed to it you sum them up and then you return the sum uh, now if you wanted to uh, test this in a using the table di driven approach uh, you would have your uh, test logic over here so basically uh, there there is logic at the bottom of the test and you start off with all the cases with which you would like to run this test a uh, simple way to build a table is to use this uh, uh, anonymous struct uh, and then uh, have expected and actual values uh, as a table so so i have two things over here uh, there's something called integers which is a slice of ints um, and uh, next to it is uh, the expected value which would be the sum of these integers um, and uh, that's also of integer type uh, so these are all the inputs there are there are four inputs that i would like this test to run with uh, and um, and these are the expected uh, sums for all of these and the code over here is basically looping over all the cases and then uh, checking whether uh, the actual value is equal to the expected value or not now you might uh, find that i am doing a t dot error f uh, and not calling a t dot fatal uh, and the reason for that is if one of the values is incorrect uh, I would not like this test to stop. I would like to continue with with this loop and continue with the rest of the inputs. So if I use a table like this, and if I run a for loop inside the test, I'm sort of forced to use this error f instead of a fatal f, um, because I would like to continue with the rest of the tests as well. So there is a, there's a solution to uh, this this problem um, and that's called uh, using something called subtests uh, so subtests are a way of uh, breaking a parent test into multiple individual tests uh, and you will find a link 
to the Golang documentation, which describes what subtests and sub benchmarks are. Uh, but in essence, what what we would like is we would like to treat each of these inputs running against the test logic to be treated as an individual test. Uh, that way, we don't have to rely on error f. We can basically call fatal f. Um, because every test is now independent. It, it has all the properties associated with an independent test. So it, it gets independently marked, passed or failed. You can independently skip it and so on. So in order for us to do that, um, the, the, the way you achieve that is by calling a method called run on the testing.t object. And what run takes is, it takes a string, uh, which, which is the name of the test, and then it takes a function, uh, which is the test itself. So you will notice that the signature matches the signature of an outer test. So basically, it, it could be any function which mimics a test. And you supply a name that you want. And what the test runner will do is it will, it will treat the code inside this function as though it is a test un under this outer test. So this becomes a subtest of the outer test. So, so what you see over here is basically a modification of the example we saw earlier. The only addition over here is there's a string called uh, name. And I am just supplying some names to each of the inputs so that there's some identity for each of the tests. And these strings are passed in as the name of the test, the name of the subtest. And then uh, whatever was the logic that you saw earlier, that's, that's still over here but inside this function. So there's a function starting here uh, and in here. Right, and um, sorry, ending here. So till here. Right. Um, and outside of this is, is the for loop going through each of the cases. So when you execute a table driven test, you will you will see the outermost test over here and you will also see each of the individual subtests being run as an independent test so they all have their own identity you can see the names of each of these you can also see a pass fail uh, status for all the values uh, so what i have done over here is there's, there's a log there's a log entry over here which is uh, dumping the input strings uh, input uh, values and that's what you're seeing over here otherwise th th this line is not expected to be there typically um, and then you you'll see a status for the whole test so uh, this this test the the parent test will be marked passed as long as all the tests inside it have been marked uh, pass uh, any any questions uh, so far Okay, so I'll, I'll move on. So uh, just, just before I go, let, let me just look at the chat. Okay, nothing else here. All right, so, so while you are um, writing tests, you will have a need to uh, write some kind of helper functions. Uh, so Go does not provide a lot of uh, uh, helper functions in terms of asserts uh, and so on, uh, the, which are typically found in um, other uh, test frameworks in other languages. Uh, but it is fairly easy to write your own. Uh, there are a lot of third party libraries which you can use, which also provide these, uh, the, these functionality. Um, some very popular ones are, uh, there's one called testify. Um, but let, let me look for it. So this is a fairly popular, uh, framework for, uh, with the, 
uh, both the helper functions as well as mocks and so on. But uh, what I'm trying to show over here is that it is it is not really that difficult to write your own in case you would like to. So in case you are um, writing Go test for the first time, uh, and if you are of the feeling that you need to choose a particular framework that you need to use and things like that, uh, I would urge you to probably try writing uh, stuff by yourself first. Um, also do explore other libraries, but uh, probably use them only if you really need it. Uh, so here are some very basic implementations of uh, some of the functionality that might commonly get used. Um, for example, I have defined a, a function called skip if, uh, and it takes a condition um, and it takes uh, multiple arguments any of any type. Uh, and if the condition is true, I would like the test to get uh, skipped. And the arguments that I pass uh, would typically be the reason for skipping the condition, uh, skipping the test and so on. So it's easy to sort of write very simple functions uh, which you can use inside a test. Uh, here is an assert function where if the condition is uh, not true, then I'll, I'll fail the test. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a package called uh, reflect uh, and that has a function called deep equal, which uh, can typically be used for uh, most cases where you would like to uh, compare two types, uh, two arbitrary types. Um, and you will see that this is fairly commonly used in a lot of uh, uh, libraries. Uh, however, there are alternatives to this as well. Uh, there are some newer uh, libraries. There's one called Go CMP, uh, which is meant to be used instead of reflect.dp equals um, in 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 tests at least, uh, so there are there are some corner cases in certain areas where uh, reflect or deep, deep equal uh, does not yield the correct results, um, and the this go CMP package is meant to replace that. So feel free to go through the documentation uh, on both of these, but I just like for you to be aware that the go CMP package also exists. Uh, because if you start looking at a lot of uh, frameworks, they still use reflect.dp uh, cool. There are a few pieces of functionality which uh, the test uh, package already provides. Uh, and you, uh, you can call these things on the testing.t object. Um, so one, one of the APIs is called helper. Uh, and what helper does is it marks a particular function as a helper function. So that when a test fails, uh, you would not see your helper function in, in the test output in, in the failure. So um, typically as a build up to the test, you might be calling a whole bunch of functions which build certain things for you. Uh, these are typically called fixtures. Uh, but when a, when a test fails, you might you might just get far too much output uh, in certain cases, and you might want to hide uh, things which are not that important, and you want to highlight uh, the element which actually failed comparison or failed the condition, so that 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 is the reason for your failure, right? So in order to reduce the noise, you can mark other you you can basically mark all helper functions with the state dot helper, uh, so that they don't really show up uh, in the output. There is uh, another API called a t.parallel, uh, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so what t.parallel does is all tests which are siblings at a particular level, uh, it allows those tests to be executed in parallel. Uh, so you need to mark the test that you want to execute in parallel by calling a t.parallel inside the test. Uh, let's look at the function. The, the, the help string for it. Okay, this is this is the code. Um, anyway, so what you would do is, um, let's say you you are in in the test code, so you have t over here. So somewhere over here, if you say t dot parallel, then you are uh, saying that I don't mind for this test to be run in parallel with tests at the same level. Um, 
no if you if you if you say t dot parallel over here and there's one more test below it which also which also has been marked t dot parallel these those two tests can run in parallel but the other tests which are not marked with t dot parallel they will still run in sequence so you get to choose which are the tests that you are okay running in parallel and which are the ones that you don't want um, to be to subject them to parallelization uh there are some other uh, nice features as well which is uh, that the t dot parallel api uh, also honors subtests so what that means is uh, in in a situation like this where you have a function over here and this is actually a subtest inside a parent test you can call t dot parallel over here inside the subtest and what this would do is it will make all the subtests run in parallel while the parent test still runs in sequence so so it is easy to clearly differentiate uh, tests which you are, which you think are safe to be run in parallel and uh, and then you can speed up the execution of uh, the entire test suite as a whole there is also a magic folder called uh, test data uh, which is a magic uh, string for a folder name uh, so if there is a folder by name test data the go test the go uh, test tools will uh, ignore this folder ignore the contents of this folder uh, and this is useful because uh, all the test discovery tools need to look for files which have underscore test and so on so um, so you can easily mark one folder for for these tools to ignore it and that is that is this folder so you can you can place um, files which are meant to be you know either golden files uh, which which have uh, which have the data with which you would want to compare results and you can just place them as files inside this test uh, data folder uh, without worry so there there's some description on uh, how that is used uh, so all all these piece of functionality uh, whatever you see over here and there are plenty of examples for all of these in the go standard library itself uh so that's a that's a real gold mine in case uh, you would like to see exactly um, where and how these are used so if you want some really nice examples a good place to dive in is to look at the sand library itself um so if you if you have further questions on this you know we can we can actually explore some of the uh, examples uh, in in more detail uh, maybe later or in future sessions so now let's move on to another uh, topic called uh, test suites so a suite is a way of uh, declaring multiple tests uh, as a collection um, and the the reason for doing that is basically let's say you have a library and that exposes a certain api uh, and then you intend for that library to have certain behavior uh, that library is also going to accompany uh, a bunch of tests right uh, and you would like those tests to probably be tested against a set of values uh, and by defining your tests as a test suite you can use the entire test suite against a multiple set of values uh, or multiple environments and so on um, a simple example would be like let's say you have uh, some piece of functionality that you have written to talk to various kinds of sql databases um and now the functionality is the same but you would you would then probably want to do some compatibility tests against various types of sql databases various implementations maybe like for example sqlite and postgres and so on so the objective of each test is the same uh but you you would basically just like this combination of tests to be run against multiple combinations so the test suites are a way of organizing uh, tests collectively uh, and then uh, subjecting them to various inputs uh, think of this as uh, the table driven tests uh, where you had multiple inputs uh, but this is like uh, m inputs into one test n test and this is like an m into n combination of uh, Uh, tests and inputs right so um, let's look at an example for now uh, so we'll get a better idea so i have a very simple uh, 
type called counter and uh, this counter is basically uh, something that that keeps count of a value and th there's a there's a method on which um, uh, there's a method which i can call to increment the internal value of this counter i can also reset it and i can also get the current value so it's a fairly simple um, piece of code um, fairly simple interface as well uh, this is the interface that i expect for for a counter so i should be able to reset it i should be able to call an increment to increment the value and i should be able to get the value at any given time and the counter starts off with a value zero so so if you if you look at a very simple implementation for a counter uh, you could you could think of it as a struct which has a value int uh, private uh, value and there are these three methods um, which are part of its uh, public uh, interface um, and increment is simply going to increment the value and a value method is going to return the current value uh, i am not exposing this struct in my library uh, but what i am exposing is a constructor um, a public function which is going to build uh, an instance of the struct and then return a pointer to it so so this is one implementation of a counter um, now look let's look at some very basic tests for the counter um i would like to ensure that calling the increment method will will basically increase the value uh, of this counter uh, so i'm just going to you know loop up to 3 and then call increment and ens ensure that uh, um the value got incremented and then i compare it against the value because i'm incrementing by one the the step in the loop is also equal to the value that i get from the counter so i can directly compare that i would also like to let's say uh, test for the reset functionality uh, so from on a new counter i have called increment twice now when i call reset it should set the value back to zero so i call c dot reset and then i assert that the c dot value is now zero so it should have reset it correctly um i mean you can think of more tests for now i'm i'm just showing you an example of two tests um so all um so basically every test is meant to be independent in unit tests so you should ideally uh, allow for uh, creation of new instances of all types uh, you should not uh, be sharing uh, any instances across tests uh that's a that's just a clean simple way of uh, ensuring that everything is independent in our case a counter is a stateful um object so we would not want to share it at, uh, between tests so we are creating a new counter in each test now let's look at another implementation of a counter uh so here i have called it a safe counter which is just an improvement over the existing counter uh and what this is doing is it is putting everything inside a lock uh so all the write operations are under a, a lock uh and then there is all the read operations are under an r lock uh this is a read write rw mutex so this is a this is a mutex where a read multiple read or one write are mutually exclusive so you can only do one of these two at any given time uh this is i mean, there, there are better ways to implement this 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 is just an example um uh, another way of implementing a safe counter would be to use uh, something like sync atomic um but um this is probably a more understandable example uh, where locks are used in case any of you have any questions uh, about this please feel free to ask um and i can explain this in more detail so what the safe counter implementation is doing is, is uh it is it's doing something very similar to um, the unsafe counter i mean there the, there's a constructor function which builds a counter for you and then it returns it and you basically get and get a pointer back
so now let's come to testing um, these things so now we have behavior which is similar for uh, two implementations and we would like to test both implementations against a bunch of inputs so this is like a typical x into y uh, scenario where you have uh, multiple set of tests and multiple set of inputs right so uh, let's try to build a suite where we can test all of these things uh, together right the first thing is that um, we we looked at uh, the original example for the unsafe counter test where we were creating new instances of the unsafe counter in each test right uh, now the thing is if you if you have different structs of different types uh, you would need to ensure that uh, you have a, a canonical way uh, rather a very common way of uh, building um, building each of these uh, types regardless of the underlying implementation basically you need a wrapper around um, multiple implementations of the things that you want to test with like in, in this case i have a safe counter and an unsafe counter and i need one common way of building both of these things depending and depending on the context i'm going to build either a safe counter or an unsafe counter so uh, let's look at a way of uh, solving this problem so what we can do is we can um, build a wrapper around this uh, and we're we're going to call it a counter builder and what this is going to do is uh, i mean it's not going to take any arguments and it's going to return um, something which satisfies the counter uh, interface uh, you might remember the counter interface from the first slide uh, which is so basically counter interface is a combination of all of these three all right so we have a common function which can build uh, any of these uh, counters and then uh, it returns an object which satisfies this interface um and then we will call this builder inside our test suite inside our test function and then we'll we'll pass each implementation as as a as a test input uh, and we'll see how that that can be done so now we have this unsafe counter builder which returns a counter and what it does is it it calls new unsafe counter inside it and then a safe counter builder calls a new safe counter the the only difference over here is the wrapper so the what has changed is uh, these these were returning uh, pointers to their respective implementations but now we have i mean signature wise we now have an interface so um, so now let's see how we can utilize this uh, inside test so you will notice that both of these tests now uh, have this signature so it's a simple function which returns a counter so let's start off by uh, building something called a suite and inside that let us have a builder uh, which has a func uh, simple func and this counter uh, and what we are going to do is we are going to set a builder into this suite each time and whatever we did earlier um, like the test that we defined on one implementation we are going to now put those tests against the suite so uh, you will see content from the test earlier except that it is now a member on the suite uh, instead of being uh, just an independent function now these tests are uh, part of the suite struct uh, otherwise the functionality is is the same here there were concrete calls to one particular implementation of a counter like uh, the test were written on the unsafe counter so there used to be new unsafe counter over here but instead of that what you see now is just s dot builder uh, and all the tests call s dot builder right uh, now the advantage here is we can build a suite uh, around multiple implementations where so i can build a suite which uses the unsafe counter as the builder element and i can build another suite which uses the safe counter as uh, as the builder uh, and whatever has been set as the builder over here gets uh, gets invoked uh, inside the test call um, and and that that particular instance gets used in the test 
uh, any any questions so far okay so let me just uh, continue so now now we have a suite um, which can take a builder um, and then run and and it already has all the tests defined against it um, and now the expectation is that whatever is the builder that you provide over here you would like to run all the tests against that builder so you so you constructed one set of uh, so you define the behavior now as tests and now you just need implementations to test against so in order for us to run all the tests uh, we will define just one parent method uh, this is just an example so uh, let's call it uh, run all tests and what i expect is that when i call run all tests all the tests which have been defined inside that suite they get executed against the uh, implementation that has been uh, passed to that suite um, and building a test uh, building a suite like this is fairly easy uh, so what we are doing first is uh, we would like to get the uh, the suite itself so um, so we we use reflect to get it uh, and what uh, reflect will do is it will it will wrap the suite around with a around a reflect object um, and uh, and then we go over all of its methods uh, the num method will will give you a number for uh, will give you the uh, number of methods on it uh, we sort of iterate through it um, and uh, we fetch each of the methods uh, and we sort of get an uh, we type cast it to uh, just a regular interface um, and then we check whether each of these methods satisfies this func testing dot t so this is a signature of a uh, of a test so we want to check whether uh, the method that we are iterating over satisfies the the signature of a test and if if it is true then we will get the name of the method and then we will see whether the method uh, has a prefix test which is a requirement uh, for uh, a test in golang if these are all true then we are going to call uh, t.run with the method name and the method this part is the same as what the the subtest example we saw earlier except we have just written this 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 function to uh, automatically fetch all the uh, test functions defined inside the suite and then uh, use the t.run uh, system to run them as uh, subtests so just calling a suite dot run all tests should now get me to run all the tests. Um, so yeah, just just a note over here. The reason that there is a check to um, to verify that there is a prefix called test is to ensure that uh, we don't end up in a recursive loop. Uh, notice that there is no test um, prefix over here in this function. Uh, and this is a differentiating factor um, between this method and the other test methods, which are also defined on the suite, uh, because they all share the same signature, the testing dot tree signature. So the names of the tests, the methods which are used, uh, the the prefix should be different from uh, the prefix that you use for uh, this function, which which intends to call all the tests. so now let us write a test which uh, aims to run all the tests inside a suite so so this is this is a test that represents the suite itself uh, and what we are doing here is uh, we are giving the name of an implementation and a builder function which builds an implement builds a builds a pointer to to that implementation uh, and uh, and then we would like the entire suite to be run against that implementation. 
So we are going to say safe counter, and then we are going to pass a builder function, which will, which if called, returns a safe counter. And this uh, function returns an unsafe counter. What we are going to do now is we are going to build uh, a suite around each of these builders, and just call run all tests on it. So we say that this is this is a test function that you need to run uh, with this name, and this becomes a test which. Uh, in turn ends up running all the tests defined inside the suite. And there could be multiple uh, implementations over here that you can sort of run all these tests against. So this is one way of doing it. So, so this is a fairly um, simple example of, uh, of how to build a test suite. Uh, there are uh, these lib the third party libraries which uh, I happen to mention they all provide some sort of implementation to uh, run a suite or define a suite and run all the tests inside it. Um, so so feel free to either use a third party library or write your own. Uh, again, the intent over here in this talk is to uh, show you how to write write one. Um, and also to just say that it's not too complicated to write one. It, it, it doesn't take too many lines of code. Um, so feel free to give these things a try. Uh, whatever examples we've seen so far, they're all uh, available in the repo. So you can just um, clone the repo and, and just run go test on the particular folder. Um, yeah, um, I think I'm gonna stop at this point. Uh, we are close to 9.30. Uh,